everybody it's dr rick dropping in on you i uh, hope everybody is having uh, an unbelievable start to your week as promised on yesterday i told you that uh, in order to combat a major problem of the lack of knowledge and ignorance in so many areas uh, as it pertains to the black struggle that i was going to start doing uh, a, a weekly series um, each week a different topic uh, using my research, my experience, uh, and everything that I've encountered over the last 30 years to sort of illuminate some issues as well as point to the things that we need to do to overcome them. Uh, I told you that I would let you know what this week's topic would be about today, and it's going to be about the miseducation of black youth in America. Uh, and each day we're going to take some readings from uh, a couple of my books or a few of my books uh, to sort of provide context. And then I'm going to do a very short breakdown of that just to give you insight into the el uh, elaborate uh, machinations that are put into place um, systematically and intentfully, uh, intentionally, excuse me, intentionally uh, for the purpose of misguiding uh, misinforming, miseducating black youth, rendering them ineffective in their adult lives, uh, incapable of fulfilling the responsibility of advancing the cause. And we're going to talk about that. So that is what we're going to focus on. Um, before I get started, uh, please note that we are still in the middle of a fundraiser and we do need your support so that we can continue to do the work that we've done for over 30 years and continue to do. Look in the description box and there will be a, several different ways that you can give. Uh, please choose one and uh, support the work we do. You are more than appreciated. So I'm going to go right and get started. I'm going to first read from my 16th book, The Miseducation of Black Youth in America. The final move on the grand chessboard uh, was a subtopic. Um, this is just a short excerpt, then I'm going to read uh, several more excerpts from two other different books, and then I'm going to break it down for you and we'll be done here. Um, I'm hoping that I provide some insights, uh, as, not just in the sense of understanding, but also in the sense of how we move forward, what we need to do. Dr. Janice Hutchison, a child psychiatrist, emphasizes the fact that all hyperactivity is not ADHD. She points to the fact that issues such as stress, abuse, or depression can all manifest themselves in some form of inattentiveness. This again goes to the core issue of not addressing the source or cause of the problem. Imagine a child that may be suffering from abuse being drugged so that he can pay attention in school or so that his teacher can be more effective in her work. It seems that everyone except the student is being considered in this equation. The next reading is going to come from my 24th book, Academic Apartheid. And two short ones in here. The first one is going to be uh, entitled Subtopic, An Alien World. It says, statistics reveal that 83% of elementary teaching force is made up of white females. This presents a double negative experience for young black males. First of all, black boys have a unique set of issues that can only be effectively engaged by adult black men. At least with a black female teacher, there may be a certain level of genuine empathy concerning the struggles that young black boys face. But a white female cannot effectively empathize with something she cannot understand or relate to. And one more. The introduction of psychotropic drugs. If the psychological devastation associated with this diabolical machination of special education is not enough, the system has introduced the prescription of psychotropic drugs into the equation. According to the National Institute of Health, there is an expanding problem as far as the use of psychotropic drugs as a means to treat behavioral and learning disorders in special education students. In a recent study, it was revealed that 40% of the students be studied being studied were on a medication at their baseline level. The primary psychotropic drug was some form of stimulants. That would be Vyvanse, Concerta, uh, uh, Vyvanse, Concerta, uh, Ritalin, um, 
and Adderall and things like that. So to, to exacerbate the matter, the 17% were on psychotropic cocktails, more than one psychotropic drug at a time. Over the course of the study, the number of those who were consistently taking psychotropic drugs increased from 40% to 52%. We'll talk about that. And finally, this is from my 23rd book, The Undoing of the African American Mind. Uh, I got two short ones from here and then we'll move on. It says, IQ tests are an expansion of the historical practice of using flawed science to justify the mistreatment, alienation, and social engineering of a specific race of people, in particular African Americans. Self-proclaimed scientists such as Carl Van Lanius and Linnaeus, excuse me, and John Friedrich Blumenkamp used pseudoscience to attribute poor, detrimental, and disadvantageous qualities to people of African descent. In fact, it was the personality flaws cited by these two men that laid the foundation for the obviation of equal rights to blacks. The studies upon which the flaws were established were heavily dependent upon the postulation that physical characteristics of an individual were somehow indicative of symptomatic uh, are symptomatic of characteristics that were genetically linked to personality traits. Purportedly, certain physical characteristics such as color of skin or the crookedness or curliness or kinkiness of hair served as overt uh, manifestation and signs of deeper internal dissimilarities among races. In other words, they were saying that you, because a person is black, the darker or the kinkier the hair, you can make the assumption that they're not smart, they have learning disabilities, that they are criminalized in behavior, and so much more. And this was used to uh, effect, and, and if, you, if, if you pay attention, it's still used today uh, by way of media to paint an image of the black male that is erroneous in, in, in all things. The, what, what is generally represented as black manhood in mainstream media, it couldn't be further from black manhood. When we look at the studies that are out there now, studies from Kaiser, studies from the CD, uh, CDC, it reveals that black men are actually more engaged with their children than any other racial, uh, racial makeup, including white men. Uh, they're more involved. Here's the big one. They're more financially engaged based off of income, what they give to their children. So the idea that black men are deadbeat fathers, not scientifically, not statistically. Now, are there deadbeat dads out there? Yeah, but actually, the more deadbeat dads, believe it or not, the ones who are always praised for working their ass off to take care of their family are Latinos. And there are a significant number of white men who do it legally through the court systems. But that's not what's going to be portrayed. It's always a stupid, sorry, lazy-ass black man who actually, statistically, is out there doing the best he can. Not, not making any excuses. Not sitting up giving passes to the cats that are out there harming women, harming children, harming the elderly, harming one another, and uh, terrorizing the hood. Absolutely unacceptable. Those cats need to be dealt with. I'm not talking about the, the men. You, anybody who knows me, first and foremost, knows that one of the uh, my biggest passions is the, the way the black man treats the black woman. So anything that is outside of the scope of that, I'm not co-signing it. I'm not giving any excuse from it. But what I am talking about is how we are portrayed, and there's a reason behind that. So I read that. So basically, um, I wrote a position paper a long time ago. Uh, entitled The Disproportionality of Special Education Referrals uh, with Black Boys. And what it did is it highlights how we make, make up such a small portion of the population, but we make up such a large portion of special education referrals and IEPs, uh, 504s, and things of that nature. And so what happens is uh, you, 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 you look at it and you say, what's going on? And it is a number of different things. Uh, like one of the excerpts says, it's easy to sit up and look at a kid and say, okay, they're not behaving. So what are we going to do? We are going to sit up and say they have ADHD. Uh, now it used to be ADD, you know, attention deficit disorder, but there's nothing but attention deficit hyperactive disorder 
the hyperactive element allows for psychotropic drugs because what they realize is if you give someone who has a, a tendency uh, bent towards hyperactivity a stimulant, it actually works in reverse. It seems to make them more docile, less active. And so they started giving psychotropic drugs. Now, these psychotropic drugs are what we would call Schedule II drugs. What does that mean? Uh, a Schedule I drug would be a drug that's highly addictive and has basically no medical purposes. And as you go down the schedule and you get up six, seven, it's more medical related drugs that aren't highly addictive. So a Schedule II drug is highly addictive, has very few uh, medicinal uses, uh, and that's what we're putting on our kids. And these are psychotropic drugs, meaning that it alters the um, uh, brain chemistry um, of these children. And we're talking as early as five years old. And so I wrote on it and I talked about all the different ways it's, it's being done. Now, one of the points that were made, that was made here was that uh, disattentiveness and hyperactivity isn't always because the kid has ADHD. Uh, it could be very easily that the kid is traumatized. There's some things going on at home. Uh, the culture is so different from the average white teacher, which is 83% of the population, especially at the elementary level where these kids are coming in and getting these referrals. 83% of the teachers are white women. White women. Uh, and so the easiest thing to do is black males of any age make white women uncomfortable. So what the best way to deal with that is to get them out of the class. The easiest way to get them out of the class is to refer them for special education. And see what happens is they go in for special education and they're normally going to be diagnosed with either ADHD or oppositional defiant disorder or some other learning disability. You're going to see a large spike in ADHD and a large spike in oppositional defiance disorder, disorder because they can be medicated for that. Now they're in cahoots with Big Pharma. The, in other words, there's a come up. See, the school comes up when the, uh, uh, the the special education referral is first created, because once a kid has a special education assignment uh, tag, then the school gets twice the amount of money from the state in funding for them. So that that's a funding thing. Now, here's what you need to understand about that. That wouldn't be that bad if that extra eight thousand was used to actually educate and provide resources for that kid. But at most school public school districts, the lead or head principal has control of the school's budget. And what I can tell you is in middle school and definitely in high school, most of that special education money is redirected to athletics, new uniforms, stadiums, and everything else, because that's where your booster money comes from. So you want to get booster money because that's how you, you, you're funding other things in your school outside of what the state will fund. So it's this big money cycle, and special education referrals pay a significant portion of that. Okay, so then you sit up and say, all right, here we go. We're, we're hurting these kids in it. You want to know about the school to prison pipeline. That's a problem. What happens is you at five years old, you've already start alienating him. You've already designated him with ADHD, and you haven't even done a real true evaluation. You haven't sent anyone to check and see how things are at the home. You haven't determined what's going on with him. You just automatically assume he can't be still something wrong, give him a drug, make him sit out. And... First of all, that's not how kids that age learn anywhere. Kids aren't made to learn by sitting still for long periods of time and listening. They are made by, to learn by exploring. No species learns by sitting still and listening. No species. Just because we are supposedly of a higher intellect doesn't mean that the natural biological process of discovery changes with us. We still learn through exploration. That's why a baby automatically starts putting stuff in their mouth. First act of exploration. They're literally discovering and identifying what it is. Everything goes in the mouth because that's the first move of discovery. So then what, am, what, what, what do we do? We have to sit up and say, okay, we can't allow this to continue to happen because here's what happened. And I have done workshops and I've written in great deal on uh, adverse childhood experiences, uh, which are uh, known as ACEs and its connectivity to epigenetics, which I have written consistently on because we're talking about the perpetuation of generational, uh, the generational transmission of trauma. So then, 
Um, so then uh, you talk about ACEs. Now you're talking about how a kid is impacted by adverse childhood experiences. Adverse childhood experiences like uh, divorce is an ACE. Uh, a, 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 a parent with an addiction is an ACE. N all forms, emotional, psychological, physical neglect, emotional, psychological, and physical abuse, all ACEs. Each one of those counts, Any each one of those acts counts as an ACE. And then we know that there are health outcomes long-term over the course of a kid's life that are impacted by their childhood experiences. So now we know epigenetically uh, that literally a lot of the health incomes that we're being told is because of the environment, uh, you know, the, where we live or what we eat. Uh, what you eat has a role to play in the development of disease, but nothing has more of an impact than environmental stress. Fear, anxiety, and worry trigger uh, and upregulate uh, up certain genes, downregulate certain genes. This is where epigenetics comes in. And the kid is experiencing it at a time when they're not neurologically, emotionally, or psychologically prepared to process the level of stress that they're putting their bodies through. And so it has a long-term impact. So even if they get treatment, even if they come out of an environment, once they experience these ACEs, a child with four ACEs, I did, matter of fact, let me pull this out. Uh, a few weeks ago, I did a a workshop for Harris, Harris County Sheriff's Office and Well Springs um, Family and Community uh, Institute, which is a clinic uh, where they treat, uh, treat individuals. Uh, my friend and colleague, Dr. Uh, David Jones, uh, founded and runs it. But I was brought in to do this, and we went through these ACEs. And how many people had three and four ACEs growing up? These, these are those. Uh, I'll be happy to get anybody who wants uh, information on adverse childhood experiences. I want to get to you, but we have to understand behavior. We keep talking about behavior, but we don't know where it comes from. We love to talk about the symptoms. We rarely talk about uh, the origins. The problem is causality. If you don't understand causality, you never solve the problem. If you don't understand causality, you can never create a healing situation. You can treat symptoms, which is just simply covering up the symptoms, making them go away, make a person feel better. That's not healing. You still have the underlying issues. The underlying issues are always there, and you don't get to control necessarily when they resurface. So, But back to the ACEs. When you have four ACEs, uh, a kid with four ACEs is 12 times more likely to attempt suicide, uh, two and a half times more likely to develop some form of immunodeficiency, uh, illness, lupus, so forth, uh, two and a half times more likely to develop certain forms of cancer, four and a half times more likely to develop ischemic heart disease, the number one killer in America, four times more likely to develop uh, cancer. Some cancers more than others. But we're talking about, again, the upregulation of disease genes and the downregulation of immune genes. See, we'll, our bodies have the genetic makeup to heal us. We were designed to heal ourselves. When we're in an optimal state of function, we are designed to heal ourselves. But that comes from the, the, the balance and equilibrium of the right mindset, the right spiritual frequency, the right thought processes, the right physical uh, wellness and the right environment. When you are surrounded by stress, you are triggering uh, your home. You are triggering a, what's known as a threat response. It doesn't have to be a physical threat. The ancient reptilian brain uh, will, through the limbic system, send a message to the amygdala, which will send a message uh, to the helicampus. And before you know it, you've got a stress response. Right? What is a stress response? It's the ancient response to a danger that says run or fight. What happens? The brain sends a message to the adrenal gland, which sits right over the kidney, to release adre adrenaline and cortisol. Heart rate starts to rise. Blood starts to flow. The, free, the uh, frontal lobe, prefrontal cortex shut down, shuts down. That's important. Why? When you go into fight or flight, 
Uh, the prefrontal cortex uses about 30% of your blood flow or oxygen when you are in a thinking mo mode, when you are working and using your reason, your rationale, your impulse control, problem solving, all of that. You have a high level of your blood flow and oxygen going to your prefrontal cortex. The frontal cortex is where all this happens. It's the most recent and most developed and the most functional and creative part, in, uh, part of the brain. This is where things happen in life. But... When you need to run for your life or fight for your life, you don't need it. You need everything to go to where you're stronger, you're faster, and you can defend yourself one way or another. Well, what happens when, say you're out in the, the woods and you come across a bear, you, the, 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 the hairs on your neck stand up. It's part of the fear response. And a lot of times it'll come up before you see the threat. Because it's trained to know when something's not right before you can consciously be aware of it. So all of a sudden you get that feeling. All of a sudden, you ever seen an animal sitting up and um, all of a sudden they get quiet and they, they, they look up and they're looking around? Threat response. Something's around them that they're sensing. They can't see it. Maybe they can't hear it, but they sense it. That's why when you when you got hunters, people who hunt regularly, they want to get that shot on that deer before that deer knows they're there and they trigger that response. They want to get a good kill shot to drop him quickly because if you don't kill it immediately and it runs, when you get it, it's going to be flowing with cortisol and it, it's going to ruin the meat. Well, so the same thing is happening inside of you. When you go through this threat response, you've got all of these things going on. But what happens? You shut down the part of you that's able to think your way through it. How many times have people I've seen people sit up and say, or have you seen people sit up and say, man, what the hell was he thinking? He wasn't. Why did he just lay down when they told him to lay down? Once that threat response kicks in, the ability to think rationally isn't there. It's fight or flight. That's the only thing you got. I'm about to run. Or I'm not going to let them get on my mouth to throw these hands. And it's just instinctive and it's flowing so hard. It's hard to calm that down until you remove the threat. But here's the thing. Now you got a kid. You're out there. Let, let me go back to the bear. You're out there and you see the bear. You run until you get away from the bear. The truth of the matter is you cannot run a bear. But let's just say you could. You run and you get away, right? All right. Once you get away and you're no longer, the bear is no longer a threat, what happens? The threat response is no longer in place. The heart rate goes down. Cortisol burns off the body pretty quickly as long as it's not constantly being uh, generated and released. So then all of a sudden the heart rate drops, stops sweating. Things go back to normal. And you go, Ooh, that was close. But here's the question. What happens when you bring the bear home every day? You carry the bear to work every day. That's called chronic stress. 70% plus of Americans are living with some level of chronic stress. Constantly worried about something. Very few people are living at it, living, living, living with it at the level of blacks. Especially the closer you get to the poverty line. The little kids that we're sending to school, male and female, they are at this level. Malcolm told us this, that only a fool trusts his enemy to educate his children. And yet here we are. It's not just that they are missing the ball. They are systematically, intentionally miseducating our youth because we're not just going to not give you the tools. We're going to misdirect you and send you in the opposite direction. So you're literally fighting, literally fighting to do the very thing that's going to destroy you. And they consistently do it. And we consistently stand by and watch it happen. They've used, as I, as I read earlier, they've used IQ tests as a means of trying to establish an idea that whites are inherently more intellectually 
capacitated than blacks. Truth of the matter is they are not. When you sit up, when one of the elements is knowledge, grammar, and communication, and it's based off a language that that is more of your first language than it is ours, even though we were both all born into it, we weren't born into the same way. Most of us were born into Ebonics, which is a descendant dialect from slavery, which is broken English, which we understand perfectly and communicate in unbelievable ways and become highly creative with it at levels unimaginable so much so that they steal it but that's not how they judge they're judging us on gr grammatical that's not an intellectual uh capacity that's a learned capacity grammar is learned punctuation is learned but they were using this and that would and in that lied the 15 point difference that they kept bringing up the truth of the matter is you put a black kid on equal footing they normally outperform they won't talk about that test, but they will talk about the others. So then what is the point of me bringing this up and talking about this? And that's so much. I haven't even scratched the surface, but let's go back to the adverse childhood experience because we're talking about health, long-term health implications. We're talking about trauma and being triggered. See, you, if, if you've got a situation where kids in school, this is when we need to discover something at home, not for the sake of sitting up going in and pointing the fingers and talking about how much of a horrible parent you are, but to say, oh, is it something I can help you with? Because mama is stressed out about the bills. Daddy is stressed out because mama's stressed out and he can't find a job and all this is going on and there's this infighting going on this kid is absorbing all of this trauma all of this negative uh uh energy this negative stress and the body can't process it on a neurological level on an emotional level on a psychological level and physically it's breaking them down so they come to school they're hyper they acting out nobody knows what to do put them on an ip now, here's the problem. This is where it starts to get interesting. Talk about the school of prison pipeline, and then I'm going to be done. So you take little five-year-old five uh, Devin. I'm just going to call him Devin. You take Devin. He's five years old. Bring him in. The teacher says he won't be still. He talks all the time. He's laughing and giggling and playing around and everything. He's poking. And, okay, so they, they want a special uh, educational referral. Uh, parents, make that a last resort. I always get three independent opinions before you allow your school to have their psychologists do it because once you give permission for it and they do it it's hard as hell getting your kid out of that when you find out that they're not actually learning disabled so be very careful with that and so here's the thing so little Devin gets referred gets assessed as having a learning disabled maybe it's opposition of the fine disorder Maybe it's a uh, severe learning disabled. Maybe it's ADHD, whatever. It is. He gets diagnosed with it. So now he's in an IEP, he's in special education, and now he's isolated and alienated. He's looked at different, talked to different, treated different than his peers. He's often derided even by his peers. And so he becomes more and more disenfranchised with the entire process, academic process because he doesn't fit in. He's being told from the time he walked into kindergarten, he doesn't belong. And so eventually he gets to the point to screw this. So as soon as he becomes of age enough to drop out, he does. Here's the problem. My, my work tells me that a person that a kid that does not finish high school is five times more likely to become incarcerated. So what you are actually watching is the social engineering of the dropout rate. I'm going to start alienating you and mishandling you from the moment you walk in here. And if your parents don't know the difference and what most black parents are doing is trusting the authority that has been placed by the state and by districts over their children, they know more than I do. So instead of questioning it, they are automatically uh, acquiescing to it and their children are getting caught up in it. And then what happens? He gets tired of going through it. And we're going to talk more about girls tomorrow because the girls are suffering on the self-esteem side of things the girls are suffering that's why we have a high uh and spiking uh suicide rate among young girl young black girls 5 to 13 we're in the number one slot in a statistical category associated with suicide 
Remember, blacks used to always say black people don't commit suicide. Well, black people have always committed suicide, but not at the alarming rates that we're seeing it now. We are facing a situation where black men are having to face the fact that they feel. Because, see, we weren't told, we were told we don't feel. Black men don't cry. Black men don't feel. Black men don't need help. Black men do everything by themselves. Nobody does that, but that's the thing that's been put on the black man. But black women have been told that this is what beauty looks like. And despite the fact that everybody's trying to look like them, they're trying to fit the mold. They're suffering with self self esteem issues. They're suffering with loving themselves because the Eurocentric idea of beauty is different than what they see in themselves. The Eurocentric idea of what's elegant is not what they see in themselves. While in open, they're deriding their curviness. In private, they are wishing they could be, but they're not going to tell you. They constantly deride our blackness, but they're constantly trying to emulate it. And if you don't, if you're not aware of it, if you don't know how to see it, if you don't become keenly cognizant of your who you are, the identity crisis I talk about so much is because they took that away. The, 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 the thing is, that's why it's so important to socialize young black boys, young black girls. She needs to know how beautiful she is. One of the things that I've done with my kids, and again, I tell, say this all the time, not that I'm a perfect dad or have been a perfect dad, but I did the best I could. And one of the things that I wanted my daughters to know, and there's some things I told my boys, but one of the things I wanted my daughter to know before they left the home is they were beautiful, they were gorgeous, they were smart, they could do anything they want. So every time I pass my daughters, and they little three, four years old, who's the most beautiful girl in the world? The response, I am daddy. Well, what can you do if you put your mind to it, baby? I can do anything I want to. And I'll pass by them three or four, five, six times a day in that house. Same question. Who's the most beautiful girl in the world? I And that big smile comes on their face. And, 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 and I am daddy. And it's just over and over and over and over again, this constant impact of being told that. Why am I doing that? So that when they walk out of the house, the first dude that comes along and tells them they're beautiful doesn't blow their mind. Also, though, when they start hearing the Eurocentric idea of what is and it doesn't align with who they are, it's so in, uh, inculcated into their psyche that they're beautiful, it doesn't shake them. I'm all of this beauty. and my, You can't tell my daughters that they're not. And I think that's something that we have to look at. Uh, it is how we set the identity of our children. It's immensely important that we do that. So what am I getting at? And this is about knowledge. We at some point have to create systems and protocols and resources. We need to be more involved in the educational elements and aspects. We start out with identity. Before our kids ever sit up and move into any system that's non-black, that's non-family. They should be heavily inculcated into their identity, who they are, what the family values are, what we can expect from them, what we are demanding of them, what they are capable of. Long before they got, when I started writing these books, dealing with uh, the education of our youth, one of the things that I did is I defined education so that we could understand it. Well, education isn't simply the acquisition of academic skills. It is beyond that. Education is, um, first and foremost, the, in, in, uh, the preparation and empowerment of our youth to eventually come of age and go out into a world that's inherently hostile towards them and not only compete but win. And the way that you start with this pre preparation and empowerment is by giving them a sense of identity, giving them a sense of self, letting them know who they are, filling them with a sense of pride in their who they are, getting to where they are never aspiring to be something other than what they are. They should be aspiring to be the best version of themselves, not to be someone else. And that has to start with us long before anybody else is entrusted with anything that they're going to their minds are going to receive. They need to have that implanted in them. They need to have it nurtured. It needs to be anchored so deeply rooted that it cannot be uprooted until they spread out and build and go out into the world. That's what we need to do. That needs to be programs in the inner city. 
that are focused on identity. Because if not, they're being told there's something by the music industry. They're being told there's something by social media. They're being told there's something through movies and other forms of media that don't measure up to the true nature of who they are and what they're capable of. And if we don't interrupt that, then they buy into the idea that I'm a thought, that I'm a thug, that the only way I'm ever going to get anything is if I shake it fast. that I have no real true intrinsic values that I can use, so I have to use my wares. And, 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 and there's nothing further from the truth. We are the most creative and, and uh, intuitive and, and inventive people in the history of mankind. Think about it every time you roll up to a stop sign, the cell phone, red light, almost all forming equipment and on and on and on this light that's shining right now wouldn't be shining well this led now but anyway the original light with filament wouldn't be shining uh edison tried and tried he got it to where he could light a room but it wouldn't stay lit because the light would blow out let him say hey bro why don't you put this filament in there check that out all of a sudden light stays on wow but we talk about Edison all the time. Nothing away from Edison. Edison was an unbelievable uh, inventor. But Latimer solved the issue. We do that a lot. We rarely get credit for it. That's because we don't take time to really truly own our own ideas. Start protecting your intellectual property. Start understanding the vast value in your intellectual property. Every idea is a billion dollars. Think of it that way. Every idea is a billion dollars. There's so many times that I've sit up and just an idea saved me. And we need to teach our children how to be that resourceful. And they can be. But right now, they're literally being dumbed down by their devices. Stop letting your device, your children's devices rear them. Stop using devices as babysitters. Take the time out to spend time talk read answer questions and discussions get rid of that because i said so and start explaining why make it make sense because their little brains need that because here's what happens when you use the because i said so the moment that the kid is old enough to make their own choices they're going to dump it because there's no reasoning behind it. It's just because they said, so I'm not there anymore. I don't have to listen to they. So I'm going to do what I want to do. And then they have to find out why they really shouldn't do it the hard way. We have to be more engaged. We have to understand the role that is played uh, by misinformation and how it's negatively impacting our children and how it is ultimately ending up in generation after generation of lethargy uh, non-purpose um, misdirection indecisiveness powerlessness and so much more we have to assume power by taking power by way of preparation in our minds in our expectations and the standards that we set for ourselves and the standards that we set on our children we need to support programs that are informing our kids that are challenging our kids that are elevating our kids that insulate our kids that's our responsibility it's not the responsibility of them it's our responsibility and so that's the thing that we got to look at and again we're going to go through these things over the course of the week in education this is miseducation of black youth in America week and next week we're going to touch on some other topic uh, if you got a topic you want me to touch on I guarantee you it's in something I've written I've researched I've done and I'll pull it out and we'll do a series on it uh, we are going to sit down there's going to be information there what you do with it is going to be up to you but I'm going to give you everything I have because one day I won't be here and I want there to be videos I want there to be books I want there to be articles I want there to be lectures I want it to be documented the things I said because some of the things won't happen until after I'm going to look and say doc said this 
Man, Doc knew what he was talking about. And see, it's not about me being right. It's about me being a part of the solution. And everybody should want to be a part of the solution in some way, shape, form, or fashion. So on that note, look, I'm going to get ready to get out of here. As I said at the beginning, if you believe in the work that we are doing at the Odyssey Project, uh, with uh, many of our different programs, what we've done over the years, our research arm, our think tank, uh, our program development, our advocacy programs, mental health, uh, domestic violence, um, and incest for young girls and young boys. Uh, show some love. Look in that description box at the top. Choose one of those ways to give and let's make some things happen. I will see you with part two of this series, The Miseducation of Black Youth in America, part one. Out. Hello everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time. You know, outside of the businesses that I run, like Myriad Business Solutions, the Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group, I also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in Houston, Dallas, and other areas. Uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse, uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you. I'm free to be whoever I